I had uh, been living in the Pacific Northwest and had been um, influenced by a lot of the Nordic style minimalism that you see up there. And when I moved back to Texas in, in 2020, I realized that this was a big hole in the market. So I started looking for land and found this little five acre parcel with a, a little muddy cow pond on it and just totally overgrown and immediately fell in love with the property when I found it. I could feel this was the place to build. The dream just gelled all of a sudden for me. It was like, I could create this transportive experience right here on this place. Purchased that property in, in a process of a period of nine and a half months from start to finish, opened our doors in uh, January, 2022, and, and the rest is kind of in history. We spent $2.3 million all in building the place. The appraisal when we refinanced in June of 2022 came in at around $3 million. Then when we, we sold for $7 million. so essentially a million dollars a key. Uh, and you can see the value creation in an insanely short amount of time is just kind of unparalleled. Joining me today on Hospitality Daily is Isaac French. He's the creator of Live Oak Lake, the beautiful seven cabin landscape hotel in Texas. We're gonna cover what Isaac has learned through this process and how he's thinking about hospitality now. Isaac, welcome to the show. Josiah, it is a privilege to be here. I've loved tuning in recently and listening to all your awesome guests. Well, thank you. And um, I am really excited to hear about your story. I wonder if you can give uh, those that are watching and listening to this um, a little bit of, of kind of the background leading up to building Live Oak Lake. Uh, how, did you, how did you get into hospitality? Yeah, it's a great question, and it seems like it never gets old because it wasn't a logical sequence of, of events. But yeah, I grew up in a family with nine siblings, homeschooled, uh, part of an agrarian Christian community. So lived on a farm, milked cows, took care of chickens and, and goats and built fence and had a really great lifestyle growing up. Um, my grandparents lived there. My parents, of course, a lot of cousins and family. So and then just being homeschooled afforded me so many opportunities to pursue interests that I had. Uh, a lot of friends and friends' parents have businesses here. We're very uh, cottage industry oriented and entrepreneurial. And my dad had a small construction company, so I got to work in that in high, starting in high school. And that's where I picked up accounting. That's where I learned construction. And I've also, also always had an interest in design. So ever since I was five or six, my grandmother would give me art lessons along with all the rest of my siblings and um, have pursued art, uh, at least in an amateur form for, for my whole life. So I've always been interested in design, wanted to be an architect when I was younger. Um, and then, of course, all of that kind of naturally ties into real estate. So I had done a little bit with a rent house for my dad and renovating it and <clears throat> managing tenants, all of that, but had never really been involved in, in short-term rentals. So in 2020, I met and married my wife, Helen. And in early 2021, I had this idea really come to the forefront of my mind. And to be honest, it had, it had been forming over a period of a couple of years I had uh, been living in the Pacific Northwest in, in North Central Idaho and had been um, influenced by a lot of Olsen Kundig architecture and kind of the Nordic style minimalism that you see up there. And when I moved back to Texas in, in 2020, I realized that this was a big hole in the market. There weren't a lot of structures like these. Um, and then it, just sort of doing the napkin math and talking to friends that own short-term rentals, I realized, hey, this would be a great opportunity to bring together these interests that I have into one cohesive property. So I started looking for land and found this little five-acre parcel with a, a little muddy cow pond on it and just totally overgrown and immediately fell in love with the property when I found it. Um, I've said before, when I walked onto the land that first time, I found it on while scrolling Zillow one morning and literally walked out there a couple hours after it had been listed. And as soon as I walked on site, like I think I even got goosebumps. I could feel this was the place to build. And it had these incredible, you know, two, 300 year old magnificent live oak trees and the makings of this little pond. And I don't know, it, it, the dream just 
gelled all of a sudden for me. It was like, I could create this transported experience right here on this place. So being able to see and visualize the unique opportunity in that land was, was a key for me. So long story short, purchased that property, uh, closed on it a month later, designed and built these seven cabins, which you mentioned, and in a process of a period of nine and a half months from start to finish, opened our doors in uh, January 2022, and, and the rest has kind of been history. So it's been a fun ride. And like I said, I mean, none of this started because I was looking to get into hospitality. It sort of found me and all the prior experiences that I had had, both in terms of work and in terms of the lifestyle growing up in this uh, community and in this family and just all these different formative uh, factors in my life definitely contributed. And I owe all the credit to, to my parents and, and those along the way that helped me. But uh, yeah, it's been very fulfilling being in hospitality. My favorite part is connecting with people. I feel like if you're going to be a successful hospitality entrepreneur, you have to have that true heart for other people. And I almost kind of feel like I go into a, a selfish ditch sometimes and like asking people questions, just wanting to connect and get their time and ask. So now I have people, a, a lot of people wanting to ask me questions too, which has been ironic because people are looking at me as some kind of an expert, but I've only done this one time and have happened to pull it off and was, was super lucky. And, and uh, that's been a privilege as well, but I just love connecting with people. So even things like this podcast and and all the wonderful other entrepreneurs out in the space building things, that has been the most rewarding part of this whole journey. We did sell Live Oak Lake and we just closed six and a half weeks ago or so. And that was a process in and of itself and I can touch on that briefly, but uh, to back up a little bit. So after we opened in January of 2022, and I've told this story, so I won't spend much time on it, but we, looking back, very fortuitously got kicked off of Airbnb. And that immediately led to uh, this, this adventure in social media where I was learning how to create content, learning to, to build an audience. So by month two or three, we had, I don't know, I think about 20 or 30,000 followers on Instagram and we're growing just a rocket ship on Instagram with the Live Oak Lake brand. And um, I knew that was going to be important going into it. I just didn't realize how valuable that would, that would become. So. Uh, fast forward a year and we grew, well, now we're at 150,000 followers, but I think we had around 100,000 at, at, at the 12 month mark. And that's one aspect of it. But suffice to say, the demand for that property, that experience that we were offering has just been off the charts. We, we have averaged 95% occupancy since the day we opened. All days of the week, all days of the year counted on all seven units. And uh, about 80% of all of our bookings, it's, it's actually about 82% now, are all direct through our own platform. So we've, start, we've seen a ton of um, success with that. Uh, I've been very transparent about the numbers. We grossed a million point one on the, the 12 months prior to selling, and we net around $560,000 before, before debt service. So but we're extremely blessed and fortunate with the, the results of all of it. People, I mean, thousands of raving fans, hundreds of five, you know, over, no, I think a thousand five star reviews between Airbnb and Google. Um, and, and just by every metric, it was a huge success. And we didn't build it to sell it. But in the back of my mind, I was always thinking, look, if somebody comes along, my philosophy is everything should have a price tag. And if they're willing to pay, X amount, I'm not so emotionally attached to this. I'm not going to consider selling it to them. So we actually entertained a few different offers. I was approached personally by tons of private equity groups that wanted to, it was really a talent play. They wanted to buy anywhere from 40 to 70% of the property and then retain me, deploy a bunch of capital and then, you know, build this portfolio. But I never got comfortable with that arrangement of sort of working in a, a small minority stake with these bigger players, I kind of wanted to do it on my own terms. Uh, so turned a lot of that down. Finally, got under contract this year with a buyer at a really good price that seemed, you know, like it, it was definitely worth taking for where we were at and worked through the process only to find out the day before we were supposed to close that um, the hard money lender the buyer was planning to use had backed out. They'd actually backed out weeks before. We never knew that. And so that was kind of, you know, all the 
air comes out of out of the balloon and you do get emotionally connected to the pro and just in invested i should say in the process of selling and all of that was a little bit of a letdown but then i was like look if this is meant to be it's going to be and if not i'm going to be perfectly happy we definitely don't need to feel pressured or like you know in a hurry to sell this this is a phenomenal asset and then sure enough like six days later we got an offer for half a million dollars more than the previous offer uh and both of these offers were way more than all the other offers had been so i was like wow this is uh this is very fortuitous so we negotiated a little bit back and forth and then signed a contract with the buyer and it was a about a six month process back and forth of things fell through on the buyer's side with investors they were planning to use and they had to get a loan then there were issues with the appraisal it was one thing after another but I had kind of actually written the idea off that we would sell it all just because it seemed so unlikely. I mean, we had been on the cusp of closing like five different times by the end of it. I was like, look, this is not going to happen. And then sure enough, finally, in mid-October, we uh, got the emails from the bank, assigned the last form, and boom, the wire came through. So it did happen. And, and then since then, it's been quite an adjustment, um, you know, pretty much completely vacating the role I was filling. I had already hired a general manager. You know, one of the, the um, hallmarks of that property that I've shared along the way is it was highly systematized, highly streamlined, highly automated, if you will, with the software we were using. So very efficient operation, but it's hospitality and you have to have key people and especially someone in management who is going to treat it like their own. So I had hired a couple close lifelong friends of mine that were perfect for that role had already trained them into it and uh yeah there was a you know a couple of weeks of transition there and now i drive by occasionally and wave at guests but that's about the extent of it so it's uh it's been an exciting few months what i'm really interested in is you know um you know you've you've spent a lot of time around kind of you know entrepreneurship circles and people building businesses across industries right and so you buy this property, you build this business. There's so many components to it. There's an operational component. There's a, a marketing component. I'm curious now, you, you just sold the business. I, can you speak a little bit to, uh, you know, I'm just kind of like curious what you saw in terms of value creation within hospitality. So uh, this is a double-edged sword because I'm so transparent. So full disclosure, I'm sure someone's going to pick this apart or it's going to spark uh, any number of emotions in other people, but uh, I have been very transparent in the entire process. And so, yeah, I'd be happy to break that down. We spent $2.3 million all in building the place. So it's, you know, $130,000 for the land and then uh, $50,000 of interest that first year. And then the rest just pretty much hard cost. There was no architect, no engineers, except for one minor stamp we needed for the septic system. I was doing all that stuff. I was a general contractor. So that was really like the hard cost that went into it. Uh, and then, so to, to finance it originally, I used a construction loan from a local bank after being told no by other local banks. The lesson there is do not be afraid of being told no. You, I mean, my friend Ben Wolf, who built an amazing property called Onera in Fredericksburg, Texas, um, he said he had tried 20 different, time, 20 different banks that had all said no to that idea. And he ended up actually selling to a publicly traded REIT about a year before we sold as well. So uh, anyway, big success story there. But um, there's just a, not a lot of institutional appetite from a lending perspective to, there hasn't been, I should say. Now that is, that is starting to change. And thankfully, a property like Live Oak Lake, I think that's a really great standard for what's possible here. But um, six months after we completed the project, we reappraised the property, refinanced, and this was early 2022 or mid-2022 before interest rates really went out of control. So it was a great move there to lock in a good rate. We refinanced, pulled all of our cash out, which I had raised from some friends and family to cover the, the equity portion, paid off the construction loan, and took about $380,000 of cash off the table. So then just as another little side note, which is so impressive from a tax perspective of why this is a great, another great reason to own this asset. We were able to bonus depreciate through a cost segregation study about a million dollars because there's so many high end finishes and furnishings in that property systems that are, you know, shorter class lives that are bonus depreciation eligible. 
Um, if you don't know what that is, there's a ton of people that explain that really, really well. You can YouTube it. But anyway, essentially what that means is the first two years, now we only, we're not going to benefit fully from this because we sold it about 18 months into this, but the first two years of profit can be completely written off. And uh, so basically we had, and technically because I was materially participating in the management of that, if I had had other income, I could have actually written off against that other income with this excess depreciation. And the bank pays me $400,000 of tax-free capital. So kind of an incredible scenario there between just a, an insane amount of value creation, an amazing tax benefit through bonus depreciation, and all of the dominoes lining up perfectly. But uh, yeah, so the the appraisal when we refinanced in June of 2022 came in at around $3 million. That's when we were able to pull out about two and a half. And that, that covered all of our expenses plus 400,000. Then when we, we sold for 7 million, so essentially a million dollars a key. Uh, and you can see, I mean, the appraisal was obviously less than half of what we actually sold for. So the value creation in an insanely short amount of time is just kind of unparalleled in my opinion in in this entire industry and real estate in general uh, i think that that's attributed to number one the number one factor there is social media so having that following between a combined 170,000 followers on all social platforms and then another 40,000 on the email list but primarily the social media following um which you know power those 80% direct bookings could be used to supercharge and and jumpstart other properties that that would be launched, which is a strategic reason why the buyer bought it, because they probably have plans to do that. It's 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 just amazing. And I, I probably spent about forty thousand dollars between a content team that I hired halfway through and then the influencer partnerships that I engaged in in that journey of building 150,000 in Instagram followers. So a forty thousand dollar investment in the social media ended up accounting for probably a two to three million dollar asset as part of the final valuation of what we sold for. Uh, so huge, huge opportunity there. We were early on in that whole revolution of influencer partnership, and, and that's become very ubiquitous now. But I, st I actually think because I'm a lot smarter now than I was in terms of how to build the social media following, I could do it again, and I fully intend to. Uh, but yeah, huge, huge opportunity. And this is all part of this macro trend of experiential hospitality, creating your own platform for bookings so that you're not dependent on the OTAs, um, automating, systematizing. There's so many elements that went into this to create what it was. One more note on the social media. So a lot of people ask me, how do we do social media? You know, ha tell us the magic secret sauce or give us the band-aid for our problem of why we're not getting bookings. And it really has to start with the actual product, or in this case, the experience. If you do not have a truly one of one, meaning there are not any others like that, especially in your region, in your state, kind of property and design is paramount here. I mean, design, design influences everything. Design is the biggest lever that you can pull. If you do not have that property, no amount of money that you spend is ultimately going to create that value. You may be able to, in the short term, get a lot more eyeballs. But you're not going to create those long-term word of mouth, you know, just wildfire type of um, uh, enthusiasm in your in your guests. So the way I look at influencers is it's just another form of of word of mouth marketing, which is the most powerful form of marketing because these influencers they have built trust and rapport with their audience, and when they can genuinely stay at your property and show that off, and you know just go on and on about how incredible it is, that's obviously going to spark something in their followers and their followers are going to come and stay and do the exact same thing. And anecdotally, that's exactly what we've seen. We've had people come back four times in 12 months and each time bring back new family members, new friends, create family traditions around it. So you just create this amazing flywheel of success by actually having a truly experiential, one of a kind, unique property. So social media, the biggest factor in the valuation and the biggest factor in social media is actually having the property that stands out. I appreciate you breaking that down because, um, 
you know, the, as you pointed out, the media landscape is constantly changing. And so for people watching and listening to this, it's not about, okay, necessarily, I'm going to take this exact playbook. Um, I think you spoke to design, starting with design being one of one, right? So that is something that is universally applicable, whether you're watching this right now, or you're watching it 10 years from now or hundred years from now, that's going to remain constant. I think I want to talk more about social media because as you pointed out, the buyer of your company valued your social media at, you know, two to 3 million. So it's not you saying it's worth this, right? That's what the buyer valued it as. And that allows them to grow and expand and build a durable business. And there's a lot of, you know, you describe your, your Live Oak as a, um, a, a landscape hotel, right? It's seven units, right? So it, it almost uh, threads a little bit of some of the elements of short-term rentals, but it is a hotel in the sense you have these together. Um, I want to talk more about social media because I'm curious how you thought about working with influencers. There's so many types of influencers, but can you go back to when you were first starting to do this? How were you thinking about this? Yeah, let me clarify one point as far as the buyer. I can't obviously speak for them as far as how they valued it. Um, they did make comments along the way that were indicative of that. But another metric to give for the valuation is we sold it basically an eight to eight and a quarter cap rate, which is quite reasonable from a buying perspective. But again, that speaks to this is a really high performing asset, which speaks to the, the social media value of actually having that that much revenue coming in. And then, of course, the efficiency of the operations. As well, it goes as... back to the flywheel, right? Because I think that's where, I mean, even if you're running a hotel or resort or some other type of lodging business, the um, that kind of being able to cut out OTAs means a lot less commissions, obviously, right? And if you're able to drive up demands, you can push rate up, right? And so you're kind of not only acquiring through cheap channels, but in that 80% is just unheard of, I think, in the world of, of most lodging businesses. But then pushing rate up is is a factor as well, which obviously influences the real estate value and the business value. So um, it, it it is a flywheel, and it does it does all feed into kind of more money for for the business. Absolutely. So as far as travel influencers, I didn't even know these guys existed prior to to actually doing this. So when we got kicked off, one of my friends told me about an account in Dallas, which is one of our target markets. It's an hour and a half away from here. Um, one quick note on that, I have to say, when you're looking for a property to invest in, to build your experiential hospitality retreat on, this is really important to find the right location, right? And there's a whole hierarchy of factors, which I've outlined before, but the number one most important is your proximity to the right population and demographics. Where we are here in Central Texas, and I'm just you know showing all the cards that I have, um, there's already plenty of people coming to build stuff here anyways, but is one of the best, it's a perfect example of this. There are plenty of others and I could list them, but the reason for that is we are within two and a half to three hours of 20 plus million people between Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. On top of that, and there's a ton of GDP. I mean, there's like uh, some insane amount of GDP represented in, in that entire area. On top of that, Texas is not the most beautiful state. So the fact that we're creating an outdoor theme, you know, nature oriented retreat that is actually beautiful, that is transportive, that when people step onto the premise, they feel like they're in a different world. It's, it's the perfect recipe to attract like a magnet, all of these, you know, hungry travelers that want to take a two or three day staycation and uh, don't have to, on top of that too, I guess another factor is Texas is a huge state. So you typically have to travel a long ways to do that. So look for population bases, but then that, you know, that are, that are large, I would say 500,000 plus, but then get away from that. You know, one to two hours is, is a great distance to be away from that. And there's a whole lot of other benefits to nature and to building in nature where, you know, it's cheaper land, there's less regulation and, and all of that. But anyway, I, I wanted to tag that on there as an important um, bit of advice for choosing a location. As far as the travel bloggers, there ended up being like five or six big accounts in Texas, I think actually kind of for the same reason that are trying to capitalize on, okay, what are cool destinations and experiences that we can highlight for our audiences for them to go and do? And I just happened to get really lucky with the first one, which was a really good one. So I paid them $900, just this account called Dallas Heights 101. And, uh, this that first one, they didn't even come out and stay. I just sent them photos of the property. I mean, we had just launched; the grass hadn't even grown up, so it, it didn't even look as nearly as pretty as it does now. 
we got $40,000 of direct bookings and about 5,000 followers in one week from that giveaway that we spent $900 on. So I was like totally obviously convinced that that was the right channel to, to, to market to. So then it was just following the, the crumb trail and then connecting with other um, property owners in the state that were also beginning to utilize this, uh, this marketing channel. So there were probably a, about 30 or 40 different individuals that I worked with in that first six month span. And about 50% of those yielded no results, to be totally honest, some of which I had paid others, which I had given away free nights, almost all of which I had given away free nights to. And th so there was a, definitely a learning curve of figuring out who is real here. You know, there's some obvious things that I should have known, but I learned along the way of being able to uh, detect a fake audience with no engagement or um, other, other obvious signs that I shouldn't work with them. And that's where really leaning into my growing network that I was developing with these other owners was extremely valuable because it's actually not that big of a the world is pretty small, especially in your region of experiential hospitality retreats. And so um, by offering value and reaching out and forming these relationships with these other owners, that was, that was really valuable. But the return on investment from, you know, just even the handful of the 50% of the that did yield results, maybe only 10% were massive results that really moved the needle. And of those, I mean, it's so overwhelmingly paid for all of the other mistakes, I just gave the numbers. I think I spent about $40,000 on all of that. And you see the value creation in building that, that audience. Again, I could have applied the same you know, recipe to a property that was pretty humdrum, commoditized, you know, average uh, Joe kind of house and would not have seen anything close to that. Wouldn't have seen any results probably. So it really does. How did, how did what did you learn in terms of working with these influencers though? Because if I look on YouTube, there's there's a whole list of videos that have a million, two million plus views of of different people who have kind of you know interviewed you, stayed on property. Um, what? How did you work with these people? Was there kind of like a set process you had, or just let them do their thing? I'm kind of curious what you found worked and didn't work. So that's interesting. Actually, the videos that you see on YouTube are pretty much. Um, there were a couple big videos like Shelby Church, who has a pretty big mm -hmm. following, and Cody Sanchez, and those were almost more business oriented, like from the investment perspective of the of the property. Those did not generate maybe any guest stays. So Instagram uh, reels and giveaways are what actually grew the brand for Live Oak Lake, but those did come as a result of again the flywheel of just all the success that was building. So it compounds very, very quickly and opened up a whole new, in my case, opened up a whole new avenue for me to share kind of the under the hood, behind the scenes, uh, tips and tricks and strategies for how to create this property, just candidly sharing from my experience, which was a whole nother uh, avenue that we can explore. But with the Instagram influencers, um, it was either, you know, in the early days, I was DMing probably no less than 20 to 30 of these every single day in wanting to work with them because I saw the value in it. And I was spending, you know, an hour or two a day, every single day, DMing people, watching what other creators were doing, just trying to learn. And I think that's such an important lesson. You've got to be willing to experiment with whatever you're doing, but especially with marketing to actually see results. And by the end of it, you know, <laughs> all the way through now, we are overwhelmed with inbound DMs from influencers that want to work with us. But most of those, again, are, or not most of them, but there's, I would say most of these creators are uh, not necessarily wor worth working for at our stage. Now, they can be very useful when you're starting because even those without a big following, as I tell people, can play a huge role in just creating valuable content that you can then use uh, and post from your account because viral reels are more important, much more important now for us than create than creator partnerships. Um, and th there it's just a numbers game. I mean, every 15 to 25 reels that we post is going to get a bunch of virality, which is going to lead to followers. And then, you know, followers are going to lead to bookings and it goes from there. But um, yeah, it was just a lot of cold outreach and then uh, eventually started to get overwhelmed by the, the amount of people. Again, the flywheel at work yeah. that saw these amazing results. I think that first 
three to six months of starting your property is so, so valuable because that's where you're actually laying the foundation of all of the hype, all of the attention, all of the um, FOMO that people are going to feel when they see your content, both from the creators and the guests. But it's also beneficial because that's when your calendar presumably is going to be the most open because you've just launched. So we were able to give away a bunch of free nights that we may not have necessarily been willing to been able to fill unless we dropped the prices below a point we weren't willing to. So it dovetailed perfectly with launching out and still ha you know, having seven rooms to fill every single night. Uh, so that's, that's another reason why it's so good to jump on this bandwagon yesterday. Tell me about meeting Sam Parr, founder of The Hustle, host the My First Million podcast. I saw a clip on YouTube uh, and, and it's interesting because I think within kind of startup entrepreneurship circles, he has a pretty big following. Can you tell me about kind of how you guys met? Yeah. So another podcast host that we both know, Zach Pusey Cruz with Behind the Stays. By the way, I, I'd never even listened to a podcast in my life, nor had I ever really even been on Twitter as a platform. And he reached out and said, hey, I've got this podcast. I'd love to record an episode with you. This was a few months after we had launched. We were just starting to get a lot of attention from these other influencers. It's not the big names like Shelby Church and Cody Sanchez, those people, but these Instagram folks. And I was like, sure. So he came, we recorded the episode and he was like, hey man, I was actually just at this guy's ranch down in the hill country. Uh, and you know, his name is Sam Parr and blah, 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 blah. He's really impressive. And I, I just kind of went over my head. I didn't know who Sam Parr was or anything. And then he was like, I think you should, you should really meet him. This guy is, he would love what you're doing. So he sent me his cell phone number and we started texting that night. And I just kind of, you know, told him what I was doing and he wanted to know about some of the numbers. And then he's like, wow, this is really impressive. We should talk tomorrow on the phone. And so we had like a phone call the next day and talked for an hour. And he was like kind of blown away with the numbers and the story. And I didn't know what his, his podcast, my first million was or anything about that. I, I had heard of the hustle. And so I was like, Oh, okay. This guy is definitely legit, <laughs> whatever he is. And, um, and then from there, we just like became really good personal friends. And I ended up going on that podcast and which got a ton of attention. And then um, he shouted me out on Twitter, which also got a bunch of attention. And I started, that's where I started post, posting all of these um, experiences and just trying to share what I had learned on Twitter as a platform, which by the way, totally shocked me as to the value of that. I, I thought Twitter was now known as X, it was just a place where people argued about politics and sports. But I couldn't have been more wrong. There is so much valuable conversation in small business, hospitality, real estate, and there's a whole sub community for all of that. And um, so yeah, that then led to a whole, you know, ton of wild connections that I never thought would have been possible with people that have taken an interest. And I should note, Sam was interested. I mean, obviously, I mean, there were impressive numbers from a, an investment standpoint, but he was also interested in it because he bought this ranch in the hill country, which he is using to Airbnb and has always had this. I think he actually has hospitality in his blood too. But, um, and that's part of maybe what's behind, well, both the hustle and hustle con and now, um, Hampton, which is his elite, you know, peer community for, um, founders and entrepreneurs. But anyway, he, he is hospitality oriented and loves short-term rentals. And then obviously that was a, uh, overlap in what I was doing. So yeah, it was, uh, I love it. Crazy story. Yeah. There. <laughs> That's pretty wild. I um I'm I, I would love to talk a little bit about what where you're focused now and what you're doing now. Um I at the beginning of our conversation you talked about um kind of you know learning with others, kind of community organizing, um, kind of you you you're a leading figure in um you know the hospitality space in in what you're doing now. But I wonder if you could um tell me a little bit kind of maybe about like experiential hospitality, why it's important to you. And, um, and then what you're up to these days with, um, you know, helping others, uh, with, on their hospitality journey. I think it's become a conviction for me through all of this, that what I call experiential hospitality, which is a broad term, but, and there's a lot of other, you know, factors and, and terms for that. Um, that is a macro trend that we are going to see massive explosive growth in the entire future of travel and hospitality as we know it. So I think that the experience of staying in accommodations or even booking a vacation to such and such a place is already, we're, we're obviously seeing this, this huge shift away from material goods and 
luxury in that sense of just like what's the most ridiculously opulent you know thing I can buy as a status symbol to um, what is the most meaningful or impactful or crazy wild unique experience I can have, especially in my generation and it's just it's the future I believe so um when I say experiential hospitality, I'm coming from the perspective of nature oriented. So whether that's amazing, like agritourism, gardens, orchards, farm, similar to how I was raised, or let's say mountain climbing or hiking or, you know, trails or uh, uh, water sports or canoeing, kayaking, whatever, the cabin in the woods, whatever that is, nature oriented um, landscape hotels or landscape resorts, whatever you want to call it. I'm passionate about that for a few reasons beyond the fact that I just think that it's a trend that everyone's jumping on. I think having a small, you know, a, let's call it a landscape hotel where you have five to, well, it's hard to put a cap on it. Let's just say 40 units that are separately nestled into the landscape is such a great, um, it's such a great model to host a, di a diverse spectrum of guests. So we have all these group events that I was not even planning for when we built Live Oak Lake. Now we have weddings and corporate retreats and family reunions and people love the idea of coming and staying with their friends and family in a setting like that where everybody has their, their little unit where they can go and stay and they can come together communally and have meals and do activities and stuff like that. So it's a great model. It affords a certain level of privacy and seclusion and charm that, that you get by having these separately spaced units in the landscape. But all that to say, experiential hospitality is a, is a mega trend, I believe. And this is my personal flavor um, with, say, a property like Live Oak Lake. Now, I've learned a ton of things even since then that I can't wait to apply to the next property, whatever that is. But um, in the process of sharing all this information with people about how I did it, you know, everything that goes into it, from the design, concept, construction phases, all the way through to furnishing, um, marketing, social media, obviously, automation, all of that. I was doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one co uh, coaching last year and realized a lot of people were asking the same questions over and over again. And I should just record all this into one resource. So beginning of this year, I finally you know, sat down, carved out two months of time, and then just really, really gave everything I had and, and built this this course with some friends of mine called Experiential Hospitality. It's a masterclass, and it's 45 episodes. It's, you know, 10 hours plus of content, highly produced. We filmed it all on site at Live Oak Lake, which is pretty cool. It's able to like walk around and actually show more than I was even telling. Uh, what I was talking about. So brought in a whole bunch of other friends and experts in the space and uh, have been able to share that now with like 120 people. And that has been really, really fun. But then kind of tagging onto that, I realized I should create a community around this to bring together all these amazing entrepreneurs that I'm finding out about learning of every single day and week that are out there that are building these properties. And so we can all learn from each other. So now I've been expanding the course into this uh, community, which is basically a, just a, a sounding board and collective repository of all the wisdom of all these amazing people in the space. And um, you can get real-time feedback, which selfishly is like the biggest perk to me because I actually get to learn, continue to learn from all these amazing people and, you know, share resources, talk about vendors and agencies to work with and best practices. There's so many aspects in this whole uh, process of creating and running these properties. So I'm really, really bullish on experiential hospitality. There's so much potential ahead, but it takes a lot of work, as you pointed out, as you've done with Live Oak, as you're doing now kind of with the community. Where would you point people uh, where they can learn more about this? Experientialhospitality.com is our landing page. We've got a little video there and uh, you can get a peek inside the course and the community so you can see what it's all about. Love it. Isaac, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Josiah. It was a pleasure.